And I want to talk today a little bit about a book I've written called Core 4 of Wellness. So the book is really a culmination of experience as a clinician in town uh, and also life experience as well. And my thinking was that when I'm dealing with patients and oftentimes in our health system, we talk a lot about disease and doctors focus on disease and trying to prevent disease or to manage disease. And my thinking was that if you think about healthcare as a tree, right? Think about disease prevention as the trunk of that tree. Think about the branches as being disease management, right? We have different branches of medicine. And then think about the leaves as being innovations. Some become new branches, some fall by the wayside. But the roots are wellness promotion. And the idea is if we can ground ourselves in optimal living, optimizing our lifestyle, knowing that nutrition, physical exercise, stress management, and spiritual wellness are the core, right? I'm going to use that word a few times. Uh, throughout. Last time I asked somebody to count how many times I used the word core. Uh, but these are really the core concepts. And what they do, when we optimize them, we optimize our living experience, right? The ultimate goal that I like to tell people is to understand what contentment and peace mean in our life. And if you can understand that for yourself, and it's different for me than it is for you, than it's for each one of us, then what happens is you're able to find that place where you're able to have a contented life, a life that's grounded in peace. And we'll get into a little bit of science behind that as well. So the notion of strengthening your fort with a strong body, a strong mind, and a strong spirit, right? So a strong body, think about nutrition, think about physical exercise as being tools that can help to strengthen our body. But stress management and spiritual wellness actually impact our physical health as well. Okay? In terms of nutrition, Harvard actually has an evidence-based food plate. Okay? Um, the American government has the food plate that you've seen on, you know, there used to be a pyramid and now we have a food plate. Well, Harvard actually looked at all the evidence in the literature to figure out, okay, based on all we know in nutritional science, what's actually the right perfect food plate to have, okay? And a simple example is vegetables. Seven to nine servings of vegetables a day, right? How many people here, who knows what a serving of a vegetable is? Any guesses? So raw is one measuring cup of uh, vegetable, or cooked half a cup, right? So now, how many people in this room actually get seven to nine servings of vegetables daily? We got one hand up, right? Two hands, two and a half, right? He's a plant, he's a plant in the audience. But, you know, the point is, most of us don't get seven to nine servings, and when you think about it, seven measuring cups of raw vegetables, a heck of a lot of vegetable, right? But if you think about it, if you have a, a salad for lunch, a good sized salad, and a good sized salad at dinner, you can easily get five to six servings. And then if you munch on some carrot sticks, cucumber sticks, celery, or steamed broccoli, you can easily get to that seven. Now I'm a big lime guy, okay? Limes are a great source of magnesium that help with muscle fatigue, uh, potassium, okay, especially in hot weather like this, where we're sweating a lot. And then also vitamin C, which has benefits for inflammation, uh, even some potential anti-cancer benefit, benefit for healing, right? So I put lime on a lot of everything. My salad dressing is lime with a little sprinkle of salt and black pepper. But if you steam broccoli and sprinkle a little salt, some black pepper, uh, it tastes great, even as a side dish, right? If you take carrots and cucumbers and just cut them up, put them in little Ziplocs and snack packs in the fridge, with a piece of lime in each bag. Then when you're hungry, right, when you're hungry, you're not gonna wanna cut up the cucumbers and carrots. That's the time where you just wanna eat something, grab something and eat it. If you have these little snack packs instead of Oreos or something like that, then what happens is it's very easy to grab the right thing, right? So what we do is we'll just cut up some carrots and cucumbers. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I got this idea because my wife had, by the way, that's my wife over there. And so she, you know, cut up all these cucumbers and had them in the fridge. And so I felt great sneaking into the fridge, getting like five cucumbers and putting them in my mouth. And every time I was like, this is great, you know. I felt no guilt, right? And I was actually proud. I'm like, I just snuck in the fridge and got some cucumbers. <laughs> yeah, you didn't even see me, did you, right? So the point is, there's good value 
when you have healthy food, or you got a plan, right? You can't expect things to just happen if you don't actively engage in your own life plan, right? So the idea with food and nutrition is make a plan. Don't go grocery shopping without a plan for a menu in mind. Because if you do, then stuff comes in that cart which you don't really know need to be had. But the minute you make a plan and you create a list based on the menu you're gonna have, now that's what you bring and then you leave the store. If you end up at Wegmans on a Saturday, you sample a little bit of stuff that they have, but then you still get the groceries that you really need to get, right? When it comes to the strong body, the physical exercise part, right? So they actually looked at, the World Health Organization looked at 140,000 people. What they found was that people that get seven hours of exercise total per week, okay, and it's moderate intensity, so you go hard enough where you can speak in small sentences, but not so hard that you're gonna pass out, or not so slow that you're gonna speak in long conversations with people. But seven hours a week versus less than a half hour a week, the people that got the seven hours had a 40% chan lower chance of premature death, right? There's no pill that can give you those odds, okay? Right off the bat. So this is something that you can do yourself. We can do ourselves. And it doesn't say what to do, right? It doesn't say do the same thing. It doesn't say do an hour a day, right? Seven hours in a week. You figure it out, minimum of 10 minutes at a time, right? So you can mix and match, pick and plan. You got more time, do more. You got less time, do a little bit less. But the key is, the more you do, the better it is, right? And so if you get to three hours one week, don't beat yourself up. Be proud you got the three hours, right? Build on the positives, right? We tend to be a culture that gets down on ourselves very easily, right? When it comes to food, when it comes to things we want or things we don't have, right? We tend to get down. People change behavior for two main reasons. Either the fear of a consequence motivates them to change, or the joy of a reward motivates them to embrace that change, right? Otherwise, people don't change their behaviors. So think about for yourself, in your life, in the past, when you've had change or when you've made a change, has it been because of fear, or has it been because of the joy of the reward, right? And if you know your pattern of how your mind works, then you also understand how you can impact change in your life. Do you need more information that will scare the, you know, out of you so that you change? Or do you need to see that there's so much value here that I can't help but do this? And if you understand that, that's also in the relationship with your healthcare provider. If we understand that, then now we know how to language it so that you can make that change an easier process. And strong mind and strong spirit, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So patience and persistence lead to healthier habits. It doesn't happen overnight. Instant gratification is really not how this stuff works, right? So when you think about it, they did a study. It takes 66 days to form a habit, okay? The British did a study in 2012. So you see these programs that are 21 days to change or seven days fix. It's not really how the body works. It's not how the mind works. It takes a little bit longer. It takes patience. It takes persistence, right? It takes believing in yourself, loving yourself to know that I'm gonna take time, but over that time, things are gonna change over time. So that's nine to 10 weeks, right? Old habits don't go away, but the new habits become more of a natural instinct, and they'll be the more natural instincts we go towards, right? I used to go in the pantry, now I go for the cucumbers, right? Still sneaking them, but at least now I'm going for the good stuff. Right? And so the point is, over time, you get better at making the right choice by being consistent. And if you miss a day, don't beat yourself up. Get right back to it. We even know that with food, if you go to a graduation party, right? This is the time of the year, weddings and graduation parties and all that stuff. If you go and you indulge, right? For most people, what happens is, now they're off track and they get down on themselves. And for a couple of days, they're completely off their, their pattern. There's a chemical called ghrelin in our stomach, which actually kicks up and tells the brain, hey, I want some more of that stuff. And so then you start getting into that pattern. But if you take the next 24 to 48 hours and get back to your healthier ways, the ghrelin calms down, right? The beast is calm. And now you're back on your plan. So the key is 
It's not about the falling off, it's about the getting back on. And the more consistently you get back on, the more consistently you become comfortable in that space. And that's very important. Inhale peace, exhale stress, right? So this sounds very, you know, okay, that's simple, it's kind of foofy kind of stuff, right? However, you're inhaling oxygen, okay? You're exhaling carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide triggers anxiety in our brain, okay? So it's literally stress. Oxygen is healing in the body, right? It gives us peace. So the idea of inhaling peace and exhaling stress has a natural connection with body biochemistry, right? I mean, there's a science behind this stuff. It's not just nice phrases and good artwork, right? It actually has science. And the science is that even if you take 10 deep breaths for people that have anxiety, if you take 10 deep breaths slowly, you actually blow off carbon dioxide, get in oxygen, and you create a buffer from having an anxiety attack, right? 10 minutes of deep breathing a day, okay? And your blood pressure is down an average of five points for the entire 24 hours. That's about a two and a half percent decreased risk of heart attack or stroke. That's your breath, right? 10 minutes. It doesn't take that long and yet has a longer term impact. And think about when you do that every day, right? That has great value that you carry with you all the time, right? But how many of us do that? How many of us meditate 10 minutes a day? Your teacher, right? So the idea is, in this room, we had less than 20% of people who actually take 10 minutes for themselves. Right? Think about your relationships, right? With some relationships in your life, you can think about this. Sometimes, if you're too far, you don't quite connect, right? Too close, and you can feel a lot of friction. If you find that right balance, and there's harmony. Now, oftentimes in our relationships, we can't shift the other person, but we can adjust our own position, right? Now, in the last group, we actually had a husband and wife who, the wife started smiling when she saw this, and the husband's face got very serious. And I said, what happened yesterday, you know? And they were like, uh, she started laughing a little bit more, you know? And I always use the example of my wife and I, you know, there are days where this is really good, and there are days where this is a lot better, right? And the point is it happens in all of our relationships. It's not just a husband-wife thing. It can be parent-child, it can be brother-sister. Uh, it can be so many different relations at work, right? And the point is, if you're finding that there's a lot of tension or friction in a relationship, it may be that you need to back off a little bit and suddenly you'll find some harmony. Or it may be that you quite don't feel the connection and you gotta actually step in a little bit and suddenly there's harmony, right? So we have the power to understand optimal distance in relationships. And sometimes it's with ourselves, right? Sometimes we're so hard on ourselves that we have so much tension built in. It's not other people doing it, we do it to ourselves. And sometimes we have to give ourselves a little break to say, you know what, you're okay, right? There's a lot of value there. The true journey lies in finding peace within, right? Again, nice picture, nice saying, so there's a science behind all this stuff, right? The true journey lies in finding peace within. The idea of peace within, when you think about peace, okay, and within especially, uh, they actually looked at how many atoms the human body has versus how many stars are in the known universe, okay? And there are 10 to the 17th power atoms in the human body, and there are 10 to the 18th power stars in the known universe. Now that blows my mind, right? It's only off by a power of 10, but think of the fact that this entire cosmos, right, is pretty much within the body. And then you think about practical stuff, our roadways and highways, right? Think of the highways in the body, the arteries and the veins, right? They get oxygen to every cell in the body through taxis called red blood cells, right? They don't have traffic jams often, because if they do, they're big problems, right? And when there's rush hour, they expand the highways naturally. When there's not much of a need, the highways contract, right? A part of the body needs more flow, naturally happens, right? The balance, we can't even figure out Route 81 through downtown, right? 
If those guys actually understood the architecture inside the body, think of our highways and roadways have changed. And in fact, in some of the big cities, they actually do that, where during rush hour, they expand the lanes, the highways. They're getting it, right? But it's a dynamic machine inside of us, okay? Think of this other example, which is not in the book, but it kind of blows my mind every time I think about it, right? Think about a black hole, right? Nothing escapes a black hole, right? Everything gets sucked into a black hole. Now think about your pupils, right? Nothing escapes them, right? Wherever you look, there it is. It goes right in. So if you're wondering what happens on the other side of a black hole, think of what's happening to that information going inside, right? The answers do lie within when you think about it, okay? And I won't go too far on that path. We've got some other things to talk about, but think about that stuff, because it's not really kooky stuff. It's actually science. We just don't have the language to express it yet. Right? They did 5,000 years ago. How many people saw the movie Interstellar? Right? That movie blew my mind. If you haven't seen it, that's your homework, okay? That and probably the internship, just for humor more than anything else. <laughs> See, everybody, a lot more people have seen that. But Interstellar is a two hour and 47 minute long movie. So long movie, but for Indians, all our movies are like three hours long, so it's kind of short for us. Um, in that movie, there was a professor trying to solve the equation for time travel. And Matthew McConaughey is in there, by the way. So eye candy. See, eye candy for some people here. So the professor is trying to solve the equation for time travel, and he doesn't quite get it, OK? And then he passes away. And his understudy looks at the equation and finds that there were two constants missing. One was the effect of gravity, right? So think about gravity, the law of attraction and repulsion in relationships. The other was love energy. So I'm watching this movie, it was not this New Year's, it was the, New Year's, uh, the year before. I'm thinking, that's cool, you know, they're talking about love, it's very nice. Except two months prior, I had gone to my National Integrative Medicine Conference. And people from Cleveland Clinic, University of San Francisco, University of Arizona, you know, they're presenting numerical data about their studies, and they kept saying stuff like, love is essential. So in this movie, I'm thinking, those guys said it. This movie's saying it. And then Harvard did a study looking at men for 75 years, looking at what brings them happiness and satisfaction. 75 years of data following these men. They wrote a book about it, and the main guy who was a British guy said, I can sum it up in five words. Happiness is love, period, full stop, period. So there's foo-foo stuff, but there's a background to it, and there's a science behind it, right? So in this movie, I'm thinking, I talk about contentment and peace, and yet in one word, the answer to the whole thing may in fact be love, right? Self-love, right? That's where it all begins, right? And so I'm thinking, so 5,000 years ago, in the Gita and the Vedas and Hinduism, Chinese tradition, Buddhism, the Bible, the Old Testament, the Quran, they all said, came to the same conclusion. Every next civilization doesn't start from that end point and move forward. They want to go back and prove for themselves, right? A teenager won't listen to their parent until they become the parent and they're telling their teenager the same thing, right? We cycle. What if we accepted that truth, that simple truth, right? And so you think about the word selfish, right? Is selfish a good word? Sometimes, right? We were brought up thinking selfish is not, you shouldn't be selfish, right? Classic phrase, don't be selfish. You know, give to others, care about others. Well, self-care, self-love, self-respect, these are good selfish. And most of us aren't selfish enough, right? Most of us are happy to give to others, but we discount ourselves and our own needs, right? And understanding a simple truth that peace begins within, right? You are connected to every relationship in your life, right? So those spokes, you're at the center of all those spokes. If you're not at peace, none of those have a chance to have peace because you're a part of that equation. The minute you have peace, all of those have a chance for peace because you're a part of that equation. Is it easy to change 50 or is it easier to change yourself, right? right? Because if we're grounded in that space of contentment and peace, and now we're seeking something, jumping up for something, if we don't get it, we come back to contentment and peace. If we're in discontent and we're seeking something, and we don't get it, 
we fall back to discontent. And that doesn't feel good. So the idea of self-care, self-love, self-respect. Think about people like Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, Mahatma Gandhi, right? All these people that we think of as being so selfless, so giving, right? They had to have been selfish first to have found their inner peace to then be able to give, right? And that selfish wasn't bad, it was good. When you step on somebody to get somewhere, that's bad, bad selfish. But when you're self-caring, self-loving, self-respecting, this is good selfish that most of us don't really do on a daily basis. That 10 minutes, we don't even give ourselves 10 minutes to breathe, right? These circles are about understanding that if you have peace within, it's easier to have peace in couplehood than with our children, parents, extended family, friends, and everyone else, right? And if any of the outer circles affect your inner peace, think about where your priorities lie, right? So if you're choosing an inner circle over an outer circle, you don't feel guilt because you're choosing peace at the core. Again, I use the word core, right? Acceptance and forgiveness lead to contentment and peace, right? If all you need in life are contentment and peace, acceptance and forgiveness lead to contentment and peace. And it starts with yourself, right? Accepting ourselves, right? Flawed as we are, incomplete as we are, right? But in all of our beauty, right? In all of the joys that we can create, in all of who we are and who we can be. And forgiveness. I'm not perfect, right? screw up every day, right? Just ask, right? <laughs> but the point is, I can forgive myself knowing that I'm trying to be my best. And it's not about being better tomorrow than you are today. It's about being better today than you were yesterday, right? We live in the present moment. Most people are depressed about a past they can't go back and change, or anxious about an anticipated future that's not even here yet. In that process, we miss out on the present, right? The gift. And so the idea is to embrace the moment. And as you take a deep breath, it brings you back to the moment. Right? Somebody asked me after the last session about um, visualizing. Right? So there's a golden light meditation uh, where you visualize a golden light at the top of your head. And with each breath, visualize that light just filling your body, soaking your body like a sponge. So when you breathe in, the light kind of goes out. When you breathe out, the light goes down soaks your body all the way through. Anytime your mind wanders, just come back to the light. Okay? You can even do that as a chocolate meditation, okay? Just to give you guys a little fun. Take a piece of dark chocolate, I gotta say 70% from the health perspective. Although I do have to say the lint uh, truffles and milk chocolate ones are pretty tasty. But in this case, dark chocolate, doctor speak here. So you take the dark chocolate, you put it in your mouth, and you don't bite into it, okay? And then you just do the visualizing. And what happens to that chocolate is it goes from this hard, cold thing to softening up, to warming up, to melting, and then suddenly there's a cool feeling in your mouth. Okay? And it's an amazing feeling. So anytime your mind wanders, come back to the chocolate. Okay? I had 150 medical students doing this. Okay? Only 10 bit into the chocolate and chewed it up before I even got started. So we had some extra. But the point is, these types of practices are about self-love, about respecting yourself, caring for yourself. So this line of contentment and peace, my, uh, a couple of you might know the story, but my son is 14 now. He was 12 a couple years ago, and my nephews were 14 and 15. So they're playing a video game, and they're like, I need to get to the next level, I need to get to the next level. And I looked at him and I said, you don't need that. All you need in life are contentment and peace. So these are teenagers, right? So you guys are laughing. They looked at me like I had two heads. Like, what's wrong with you, man? You know? And my 15-year-old nephew is a quiet kid. He looks at me and says, I need food. Otherwise, I'll die. And I thought, oh, man, I think he's got me. And I said, well, wait a minute. You want food because you want to live. If you had contentment and peace and didn't have food, you'd die in peace and you really wouldn't care. <laughs> I said, at 15, eat your food, have seconds, enjoy life, but just understand, it's a one. And two days later, he had an English test at school, and he comes home, and he's like, guess what? So what happened? He goes, I had to write an essay, so I wrote about that contentment and peace stuff you were talking about. So I was like, that's awesome, that's cool. And he looks at me, and he goes, eh, I guess. Goes back to his phone, starts playing, you know? But even that 15-year-old 
something sunk in, right? And so we think about this stuff, we take the time to reflect on what do these terms mean for me in my life at this stage where I am, okay? With the things that I deal with in my life every day. And we talk about stress and stress management, right? And the idea is simple. Own what's yours, let go of the rest. I had one lady who brought in like seven to eight pages of all the stresses in her life. Right? And then I said, wow. And I said, okay, let's break it down to two columns. Things that I can do something about, things I can't control. She came back, and one page was hers to own. The other six were things in her life, but they weren't things she could directly impact. Right? And so now she had an action item list. Anytime her mind wandered, she would go back to her action item list, pick an item, make an action plan, get it off, and then get a nice fat permanent marker and just erase it. And she saw her list shrinking, she knew she was actively managing her life. Stuff comes on, stuff goes off, but when it does, if we know what to own, we can make an action plan, get it off our list, and then we keep moving on with life as well. Think about relationships, right? The idea of the two posts of a ladder, they're in relationship held together by those rungs, right? If we don't constantly reinforce those rungs, the posts tend to drift apart. Right? And so, things like trust, mutual respect, sharing goals, availability, caring, love, acceptance, communication, forgiveness, honesty, compromise, and commitment, right? These are all the things, and there are many more that you can think of. Rungs to keep a relationship. And if you think about it, communication is central, right? It's very important because the person that we met 20 years ago you may be with them, but if we haven't shared, then we've kind of evolved into our own different spheres. And sometimes the rungs aren't strong enough to hold it together. And sometimes it's not a bad thing, it's just the way nature works, right? We walk this path in life and there are times where there are people on the path with us and then their journey is in a different direction. Ours might be in a different direction. And if we force it, it's a bigger struggle sometimes, right? I like to say if you're struggling with something, you're probably doing it wrong, right? And the idea is most things in life, you can think about a plan and it doesn't have to be a struggle. If we learn, what contentment and peace mean for ourselves. And so, we can let go of the things that take away from that, right? Sometimes it's things, sometimes it's people, right? Sometimes it's stuff that we have. We may not always be happy, but we can learn to be at peace with any given situation. I used to say that in any given situation, you have two choices. You can choose to be happy or you make the other choice. The choice is always yours, don't point the finger elsewhere, right? It's about owning it. And one of my patients said to me, he said, you know, you can't always be happy, but you can be at peace. And that made a lot of sense to me, because when you think about it, if somebody close to us passes away, we're not going to be happy, right? But we can be at peace knowing that their journey is going in a different direction. Right? And so the idea is understanding the difference between happiness and peace. Happiness is fluctuating. In fact, there was a great study, okay, um, that talked and looked at happiness that's sustained versus happiness is fleeting. And people that hung their happiness on things outside of themselves, right, had happiness if they got the thing and weren't happy if they didn't. People whose happiness was grounded in their own self-worth, right, always had it. It was sustained because it wasn't dependent on other people or other things out there. It was an internal joy. Right? And so the idea of self-respect, of self-love, right? Of self-fullness, right? Is the idea of giving yourself that chance to value yourself, taking the time to do that. And trying too hard to reach the life we want, we lose sight of the life we're living, right? Just today, before I came here, I had a, a new patient that came in, and we were talking, and he had a lot of regrets, okay? And so, we were talking about it, and he had regrets about the choices he didn't make, the direction his life didn't go in. And so, what was being missed was the joy in the life that was, right? And the people that were there in the life now, right? And so, as we spoke, 
he started to recognize that, yeah, this is pretty good in my life. Yeah, actually, this is not bad. And it wasn't about, well, I could have had this, but I do have this, right? In fact, I have to give uh, Megan credit uh, because she put something out there today that was very interesting. And it was the notion that of saying, rather than saying, I deserve this because I am, right? It was about, I'm valued. I should be valued for this, right? Because when we think we deserve something, we're owed something, right? That comes with a chip on our shoulder. It comes with an edginess, right? Versus when we value ourselves and have to say, I'm worth this, right? I, I should have this because I'm worth this, not because I deserve this. Now we're actually giving value to ourselves, right? Not just expecting, but actually valuing what is, right? Appreciating who we are as a person. And so thank you, man. Connect the dots of joy in your life and you'll paint a smile, right? All of us could paint the other picture. I can tell you a thousand things that just happened today that could make me paint a frown, right? But the reality is, if we start to connect the dots of joy in our life, we can paint a smile. And we keep adding to those, right? Create more joyful moments, right? We'll do one now. Everybody smile for me. You done did it. Right there. Come on, Steve. There you go, right? So it's a matter of and even with the smile, even if you fake it, it works, okay? So when you smile, serotonin goes up in the brain. That's our feel-good chemical, okay? Cortisol goes down. That's our stress hormone. A smile is better than a pill. And the thing is, you can do it anytime, right? For me, it's simple. I look in the mirror and either I'm smiling because of the day or because of the goofy expression. Either way, it works, okay? So whenever you think about it, whenever you're walking, whenever you're thinking, when you're in deep thought, just put it on. The minute you do, you're creating a healthier you. And in fact, approximately every seven years, every cell in your body is new. You're building a new physical body. So if you're doing it with a smile, think of what that, what's happening in that body. Right? Happiness truly is an inside job, right? As I said, as that study showed, right? When it comes from within, it's not something somebody else can own, right? You own that. You create that. And when you fill yourself up with that and then emanate it to the world, right? The best thing that happens is it's contagious and other people are happier because of you. The worst thing that happens is you're still happy. That's not a bad trade-off, right? And so that's important. So think about this. The life you've lived thus far is a story to be told. We all have a story, right? Full of joys, full of stresses, distressful events. The life you have yet to live is a story only you can unfold, right? Empowering yourself to give yourself the best life that you can give. And that life grounded in contentment, grounded in peace, right? If you're grounded in contentment and peace, you're no longer seeking, right? People seek when they're in distress. Right? If you've got the answer and you're living in that place, now, whether you have tomorrow or not, you're complete, right? The day I'll embarrass my wife, I did that last session, I'll do it again. The day that she made the mistake of saying I do and agreed to mar marry me, right? I told her from this day forward, I'm living on bonus time. Right? She said, what does that mean? I said, well, you just fulfilled my last wish that I had growing up of what I wanted. Having a child, not guaranteed. Having a job, not guaranteed, right? Relationship or however long it lasts, not guaranteed. But at that moment, my personal goals, whatever I had, were complete. And so for 18 years, I've been living on bonus time, right? That doesn't mean I don't have wants. That doesn't mean I don't have goals, right? I still want to build integrative medicine and get this message of wellness out. I want you guys to take it to the next level, take it to people in your lives. But the reality is, this is all bonus time. And so in this space, if I'm being given a gift, am I going to distress or am I going to enjoy it and try to make the most of it and try to have an optimal living experience? Right? It's pretty simple. In my office, the staff are always asking, why are you smiling? I'm like, well, because the alternative sucks. And so it's much easier to smile, use less muscles, serotonin goes up, I feel better, lighter on my feet, and so it just makes so much more sense to be in that space. 
And so I put this book together mainly to get a message that's consistent that people can have over time. Uh, primarily for my patients, primarily for my friends, but most importantly, it started when my son was two. He's 14 now. And the joke in our house was, if you ever finish this book, she said, I'll publish it for you. And so, you know, we published it, um, and it was for my son. It was for the next generation. It's to pay it forward, because this is the stuff that's 5,000 years old. There's nothing new here. I'm not saying anything that most people in the room don't know. It's about living it consistently, right? It's about letting go so we can embrace ourselves. Letting go of our wants, letting go of our frustrations, letting go of that feeling of distress, the doom and gloom feeling, right? And knowing that at this instant, from this instant, I can create joy and add to those points of joy in my life and continue to be in that space, right? And suddenly, there's a shift in your life, right? Try it for 66 days, right? Takes that long to form a habit, right? 66 days according to a study. So when you do it consistently over time, you're gonna be amazed at the transformation you feel. More importantly, the contentment and that peace that you feel. Questions, comments, thoughts? All of that is in there. So the way the, the book is, it's in the four sections. Nutrition, physical exercise, stress management, spiritual wellness. And the goal is, if you're optimizing your mind, body, spirit, these are the core fundamental concepts. You know, depending on your health conditions, yeah, things may be a little bit different, right? Um, and for particular conditions, we may need to tweak things. But at the core of it, the fundamentals are right there as well. Other questions? Yeah. How many hours a week do I get exercise? Anywhere from 30 minutes to seven hours, depends on the week. But I don't beat myself up about it, right? So the goal is to get to that seven hours as much as possible. In the summertime, I definitely get it more. Uh, in the wintertime, we actually uh, learn of our weakness. So I kept saying, yeah, I'll just do it at home. You know, I'll just do it at home. And then we weren't doing it at home. And so the wise one in our relationship said, you know what, let's just join a gym, we'll be committed. Uh, a few years ago, we actually were doing karate with my son. So we got to second degree black belt in karate. So we were very active. Then you kind of fall off the wagon, right? But it's not about how often you fall off, it's how you get back on. So we joined the Y. And then the rule was that if you don't work out, you don't get fed. So after work, I went to the gym and then I'd go home and so then I had a chance to have dinner. And so, you know, you play these games with yourselves and you enjoy it. But the point is, get creative so that you can optimize your living experience. That's the bottom line.